And it's time for a little bit more on RL transient circuits. Okay, so we left off with a fundamental definition for our inductors, that the rate of change of current with respect to time is equal to the voltage across the inductor divided by the inductance L. And the important thing about this is that the current through an inductor cannot change instantaneously because an instantaneous change would imply that di dt is infinite. And in order to get that, the voltage source would have to be infinite. And of course, there is no such thing as an infinite voltage source. So consequently, current can't change instantaneously in our inductor. Now, if we just took a very simple circuit, which consisted just of a voltage source, E, nice little switch here, and an inductor L, we close the switch. What happens to our current? All right, so here's time, here's the current. Well, the instant we close the switch, there is no current flow. Because again, initially, everything was at rest here. Uh, we had no current flow, right? This switch wasn't open. So right after we close the switch, that must still be true. So that current is zero. So it starts down here, all right? Now, what ends up happening, of course, is the current will begin to rise. So we are going to see this thing come up like so, right? And the, the rate of that change is basically E over L. But again, because the voltage source is sort of going to run out of steam, it's not going to be able to supply more and more and more and more and more and more current. Eventually, this thing is just going to start to peel off and flatten out, all right, to some, you know, maximum value, depending on the source. All right, now, what if we go a step further and we throw a resistor in here? So let's modify our circuit just a little bit. I'm going to keep in our source E, and I'm going to put a little switch again in here. Yeah, position one, position two. Now we have resistor R and an inductor out here. So far, so good. All right. So we start in position one. All right. There's no current flow. We sh close the switch. In other words, complete the circuit, and we see what ends up happening. So let's do a couple little plots over here. Okay, I'm going to do um, a current plot over here. Now I want you to notice that this current, matter of fact, let's do this in a couple of different colors. This current I and the voltage across R have the same exact shape. Right, because after all, this is... Um, controlled by Ohm's law. So as the current changes, so does the voltage. All right. Okay, so initially what ends up happening is we get a trajectory of current, what we had over here. In other words, you get an initial trajectory of E over L. So this thing starts up like this. Okay, that's just what it, this is what it's tending towards. Put a little dotted line in over, over here. So that slope that initial slope is E over L, okay? The current, of course, um, is zero. When, as, soon, as soon as we close the switch, and therefore the voltage across resistor would have to be zero. KVL has to be true. So if the current's zero and the drop across R is zero, then all of E must be dropping across L. Right? So we see this same thing. I'm just going to kind of parrot it like this. But as this current starts to grow, what ends up happening? 
well, the voltage across R starts to grow. All right, so let's make a little plot of that. So here's my uh, VL value, right? So as I said, the VR is going to start growing, my green plot over here, and the VL is going to start to decrease because of KVL. KVL says that E has to equal the drop across the resistor plus the drop across the inductor. So what do we see over here for this guy? Right? This thing starts up here at E and then immediately starts dropping. All right? Okay, so as this drops, there's less voltage across the resistor. Uh, excuse me, as, as, yeah, as, as this drops, let's get this straight now, as this voltage drops, there's more voltage across the resistor, which means that there's uh, a higher current, okay? Now, as that goes up, the voltage that's left changes the slope, okay? Initially, there was no drop across R, so... We got all of E across L, and that gave us this initial really steep slope. But as the current rises, more of E is taken up by R, right? So the other way you could look at this is that VL right, is going to equal E minus VR. So as that current climbs, this goes up, which means VL goes down. But because VL goes down, that's what's setting up the current. And we have this little kind of a circular thing happening, right? Um, so as that voltage drops, then the slope also drops. All right, so as VL drops, VL over L drops, which means that the slope is dropping. So this thing goes like this, it starts to peel off. The longer we wait, the... Uh, the larger the current becomes, right, so the current is just echoing this, all right, and what ends up happening is, as this guy starts to drop, you know, eventually this thing is going to head towards zero, and all of E is going to drop across to R, but the smaller this gets, the slower this becomes, so this thing really just uh, kind of does one of these, as does the VR. All right. So, you know, where does this wind up? Okay. You know, where do we, where do we um, finally limit ourselves? Well, this current right here, right, where this thing eventually flattens out, the maximum current you can get would be to have all of that voltage source dropping across the resistor, meaning there's nothing sitting across the inductor. All right. Okay, how long does that take? Now, this is a similar situation we saw with the, with the uh, capacitor. Well, basically, um, if you look at it this way, you start off with this slope, okay, this E over, uh, e over L slope, and we're trying to get to um, this value here, this E over R. And if we waited, if, if we waited until we get there, on the initial trajectory, right? That was the dotted line coming up like this. That initial trajectory, how long would we have to wait? Well, to get to, to get to E over R on that initial trajectory, right? Um, which is uh, E over L, we would have to wait L over R seconds. Okay. So um, what winds up happening is this L over R is the time constant. All right, so in other words, if you multiplied the slope by this period of time, you would have gotten that uh, maximum value, right? So L over R is a time constant tau, just like what we saw with the capacitor. 
time constant there was you know RC. Here it's L over R. So it's inversely proportional to the resistance. Cap, bigger resistor, bigger cap, longer time constant. With an inductor, the bigger the inductor, the longer time constant, but the bigger the resistor, the smaller the time constant. All right, so that's an inverse sort of relationship. But you know, this curve that I'm drawing here, it should look familiar. It's the same equation that we have uh, for the capacitor. And guess what? Steady state is going to be reached in 5 tau again. No big surprise there. Okay, so we would find out what L over R is, multiply that by 5, and that tells us how long it's going to take to get there. Okay, so do we remember what those uh, shapes are, right? Those are exponential shapes. So the falling curve, the discharge curve in this case, or I shouldn't call it the discharge in this case, but um, it will, well, it will be, because we're going to see a charge and a discharge. Right now we're on charge phase. Uh, but anyway, so this, this, blue one will match colors right the falling curve the vl of t is whatever your e value is right that's just a scaling value times e to the minus t over tau right so t a little t is uh, you know the, the time of interest right where do i want to find out what it is oh it's at this instant in time, okay, let's come up, bingo, there's our voltage, all right? Um, tau, of course, is the time constant. Now, the other curve, the sort of rising curve, all right, so this is uh, your I value or your uh, V of R value. So your I value, I'll write them both down here. So I of T, is going to be that maximum current, right, which in this case is E over R, times the quantity, 1 minus E to the minus T over tau. Okay? Basically, it's unity minus the blue curve gets you this curve, right? Um, if we're interested in the voltage, right, so this is the voltage of the resistor, Basically, it's this current times the resistance. Um, consequently, you know, you got R over R over here, and that just disappears. So you just end up with E times 1 minus E to the minus T over tau. All right. Beautiful. Okay, so let's look at an example. Take a circuit. Let's say we put in a 10-volt source. And I'm going to do something similar to this. I'm going to make three positions for our switch. Position one, two, and three. Position three is going to go down to ground here. There's my position one. Switch will go like this. One, two, three. Put in a 1K and a 1 millihenry. All right, so we're going to start at position one. Go to position two, eventually go to position three. So the first question is, uh, you know, what's time constant on this? Okay, that's L over R. So L is a millihenry. R is one K ohm. All right, so millis over Ks get you mics. That's one microsecond. So steady state will be 5 tau or 5 microseconds. All right, fairly quick compared to some of the capacitor examples we were looking at. Remember, bigger the resistor, the bigger that resistor, the faster this thing is going to go. All right. Okay, so we've got steady state in 5 microseconds. So let's plot this. Let's see what this looks like. You know, and if you're thinking, hey, when are we going to hit position three? Well, we're going to hit it soon enough. All right. So I'm going to do uh, the current again. Do that in red again. 
So what we would expect is this thing to start at zero, right? Because at position one, again, there's no circulating current. So current can't change instantaneously. We go to position two. So right at this instant, we go from position one to position two. Boom, we connect up. Initial current zero, but it's going to start at this rate that's 10 volts over a millihenry, right? You could figure out, right? 10 volts over a millihenry is like 10,000 volts per second. Um, well before we get to 10,000 volts, you know, we're going to plateau at 10. So what ends up happening here, uh, the maximum current we're going to get is when this voltage falls to zero and uh, all the 10 volts drops across the 1K. Right, so that E over R value, that's our maximum value. That's 10 volts over 1K. So this thing is going to max out at 10 milliamps. Right. Put a little construction line over there. Okay, so this thing kind of comes up and eventually flattens out. So how long does it take to get there? Well, you know, it takes basically... Five microseconds. All right. Now, uh, the VR, if we want to do the VR again, um, we'll just essentially trace this, right? Just kind of like I did before. So here's my VR. It's basically going to follow the same thing up. I'm just going to draw it kind of underneath it so we can see it. And of course, that's going to um, max out at the total power supply at 10 volts. So this value here is going to be 10 volts. All right. Okay. Beautiful. Now, VL. Again, remember the KVL. VR and VL have to add up to E, has to add up to 10 volts. So what do we see? VL goes like this. All right. And again, after five microseconds, burp. We're pretty much at zero volts. Okay, so at some point after that, you know, I don't know exactly where, but at some point after that, we'll say we throw the switch from uh, position two to position three. All right, we'll say it's right at this instant here. What ends up happening? Again, current cannot change instantaneously. So, at this point, right, right before I throw the switch, what's happening? You have a current flowing like this. And that current is equal to 10 milliamps. Okay, there's virtually no voltage dropped across there. Ideally, there's zero voltage. Remember, um, our approximation, you know, for initial and steady state. For initial, uh, inductor looks like an open. For steady state, it looks like a short. So 10 volts over 1K, and we get, you know, 10 milliamps. Okay, plus to minus, plus to minus. I mean, in reality, there actually is a very, very small drop across here. Um, theoretically, this never gets to zero, but even in the real world, where we could maybe perhaps ignore that after, you know, seconds, um, you still have coil resistance, which will... You know, if you go into lab and actually measure this, you are you're going to see some finite little little voltage out there. But in any case, um, plus to minus, plus to minus. So you have virtually 10, virtually 0, it adds up to 10. That's what we see. Now, we throw the switch. Current can't change instantaneously, so that must still be true. But you no longer have this source in there, right? Now when you go to position 3, you have this. All you have left is the... Uh, uh, inductor and the resistor, but the current's still flowing in this direction. Can't change instantaneously. So what ends up happening? KVL still has to be true. Well, look at this. You know, if this is plus to minus, then this thing, the voltage across the inductor, has to be minus to plus. And this potential and this potential are going to have to be the same magnitude. But if you have this polarity and the current is coming out of the plus, what does that mean? It means the inductor is now acting like a source, right? So the energy that was stored in the magnetic field is now being released back into the circuit, back into the resistor in this case. 
So what do we find happening? Well, as long as I have the red pen here, let's continue with the current. Um, that is going to start to decrease. So we're going to get this discharge curve, right? the falling curve that I alluded to earlier. And it's going to do this deal. Now, we still have 1K in here, and we still have 1 milli uh, Henry. So the time constant has not changed, right? That's still going to be one microsecond. It's still going to be five microseconds to get to steady state. So wherever we threw this switch five microseconds later, um, we're going to be basically at zero current. Okay. And again, the, um, the voltage across uh, the resistor is going to just track this. But what happens to the voltage on the inductor. Again, remember KVL. If you go around a loop, it's got a sum to zero, right? Or sum of rises equals sum of drops, however you want to say that. So that's plus to minus, that's uh, minus to plus in this, in this form, in position three. So basically, the, uh, with respect to ground, the polarity on the inductor has flipped that's a negative voltage, right? There's your minus sign. Here's your ground. So this voltage spikes down, goes negative. It, in fact, goes to minus 10 volts. Right? Here's your plus 10 on the resistor. Here's your minus 10. And then this thing is going to fall back towards zero. So, again, you could look at this distance. That's like a, the KVL proof because you only have the two things. You have VL and you, and you have VR, right? VL and VR that's going to have to sum up to zero. So here's your VR, here's your VL. Boom. Five microseconds later, there you go. Okay, thing is flat. Basically, all the energy has been dissipated. All right. Now for a practical thing. Let's say you go into lab and you try to build this up. Okay, you get a nice fast digital scope to measure the potentials and so forth. You might not see this. You might see something entirely different. And it all depends on the construction of this switch. What do I mean by that? Construction of the switch. Well, the question is, do you have a break before make switch? Or do you have a make before break switch? Huh? Basically, does this switch, right? You think of this as a little like wire that's swinging back and forth, right, on two contacts. Does it break connection to two before it makes connection with three? Or does it make connection with three before it breaks connection with two? You could get um, switches that, you know, work one way or the other. A standard toggle switch is going to break before make, but you could get a wafer switch that's make before break. Well, if you have a standard toggle switch that's a break before make, right? So, so what ends up happening is at, a, at an instant, we'll, we'll say it's a split instant, this thing is traveling between two and three, right? So it's like here, it's in, you know, nowhere land. It hasn't actually connected. So what do you have in that case? Well, what you, what you have is this resistor and this inductor and essentially an open circuit out here because it hasn't made contact yet. But again, current can't change instantaneously. Uh, hey, what happens? If I still have um, you know, 10 milliamps coursing through here, what's the resistance of this open? You know, it's a billion D7 ohms, you know, it's 11 D6 ohms. I mean, it's just a huge, huge number. It is, you know, the resistance of that air gap, basically. And if you do a little Ohm's law calculation, suddenly you find out, you know, you got six gazillion volts across there. Well, in fact, what's going to happen is when you get a really high voltage, this is going to arc. It's going to spark through because the, the air, air in this case is being the dielectric, can't withstand that voltage pressure, and we get an arc. So if you did this in lab and you threw the switch, you might actually see a little spark. Okay, if you had like an open, like a knife switch, and you could actually see that, see this short-lived little spark. OK, um, and what will end up happening in that case is let's use I'll use black. What would happen in that case is 
um, your time constant would change drastically because now you have a really, really big resistor, right? So when we look over here, really, really big resistor means really fast time constant, really small number. Um, but that current's going to go through a really big resistance. So what ends up happening is this thing produces a big, big negative spike off the page. But the time constant's really short, so it's actually going to come back towards zero much quicker. Okay? The area under the curve is basically the same. You still have a total amount of energy that's uh, being released back into the circuit. Um, another way to, to think about this is, what if I had a resistor in here? If I had a, another 1K resistor, um, and we forget the business about the, the switch, like if I have a, a make-before-break switch, um, what ends up happening now is you'd have 2K for your discharge resistance, right? So um, 1 millihenry over 2K would get you half a microsecond, and now 5 tau would be 2.5 microseconds. But when the... Um, uh, switch made contact with number three, you'd have 10 milliamps flowing through here, which would also flow through the second 1K. That would give you 20 volts. In other words, you'd have 20 volts across the inductor, right? So this spike would go down to 20 volts, but it would come back in half the time, right? Twice the voltage, but half the time. This is really important because um, most uh, cars and trucks that we have on the road rely on this okay not not big diesel trucks but um you know smaller vehicles um regular gas engine this is where the ignition comes from you know we talk about spraying uh, fuel and air mixture and a piston and then it gets ignited by a spark plug that's what the spark plug is right we have an ignition coil we get a current flowing through it we open that connection and actually what's left this right here would be the spark plug right very tightly calibrated distance between the two electrodes um, and that will arc through at a certain voltage and that's when it's going to ignite the air fuel mixture make a nice bang move the piston okay and we get some mechanical motion out of that um, if you've ever worked on a car like that and you've accidentally touched the uh, ignition coil wire while you were working on it, while it was running, you knew you touched it, right? You get a bad, bad uh, snap. It bites you, right? You get that voltage spike, you know, and uh, you'll certainly know it, right? Um, so that's, a, that's an important thing, okay, for, for uh, transport. Of course, eventually, hopefully, we can transition off of, of, off of uh, gasoline engines, get onto electrical motors, right? And uh, lots of advantages there. We wouldn't have any kind of spark gap or anything like that. No carbon, wonderful situation. But that's just, you know, a simple example of where we might do it in, in uh, everyday life and you don't even think about it, okay? All righty.